Hey guys, this video is about the cell theory. Um, the cell theory has really developed over a period of time, and the first part of it is that the cell is the basic unit of structure and function. And what we have here is a paramecium. You can actually see this little paramecium has got little cilia around it, and they're going to help it move around. And a paramecium is a single-celled organism that is kind of like a hunter, but in a water setting. So they'll swim around water trying to find food. And so everything this paramecium needs is encompassed in this one cell. So it is both the structure that is the organism and the function uh, that this paramecium has. Humans are a little bit more complicated. We're not a single-celled organism like a paramecium, but we're a multicellular organism. So this digital rendition of some of the organ systems can kind of give you an idea for some of the different cell types we have. For instance, if we're talking about our intestines, there are intestinal cells, and those intestinal cells will come together, and they are the basic unit of structure for an intestine. They also have the basic functions that will occur there. So intestinal cells will tend to be, so intestinal cells will be very, very close to each other in the lining of your intestines. Try to prevent any of those acids or enzymes from getting out of there. And they also have the ability to excrete those enzymes. The second part of the cell theory is that all life is based on cells. For instance, here we have our paramecium. He's a single-celled organism. He's alive. And typically speaking, anything that doesn't have at least one cell, we don't include as living. And so if we look at these cells here, you might not be familiar with what they are, but they are heart cells. And so our heart cells will be uh, an individual cell that is both the structure and function like we had before, but it's the basis of life. And of course, our heart is important to us because heart cells come together into muscle tissue. That muscle tissue forms into the organ, the heart, and that organ will pump blood throughout our entire body. So this life that, it, that we are is based on cellular function. Uh, Matthias Schleden uh, actually concluded that all plants were made of life in 1838, and Theodore Schwann concluded that all animals are made of cells in 1839. These two scientists worked to look at multiple different organisms, as many as they could find, and every organism that they looked at had cells being the basis of their life. Cells also come from other cells. As you can see here, this is again our friend paramecium, but you notice that there appears to be two of them, and that's because paramecium is dividing. It's, it's separating into two new cells. Throughout history, we have yet to see any cell arise from nothing. Most of the time, we're, we're looking at some kind of very, very specific cell division process, like we'll look at in mitosis, and some of the time we'll have binary fission, like you're seeing here, where, where, where just like they're splitting apart, like bacteria does. But we've not seen cells appear out of nothing. In 1855, Rudolf Virchow uh, proposes that cells are produced only from cellular division and other cells. Here uh, is the first cell that could be a human. This is a zygote. You can see the two nuclei coming together. That will be the nuclei of the sperm and the nuclei of the egg. This cell will eventually turn into a human through mitosis. Again, these are stages of mitosis that we'll talk about later. But basically, this one cell was all that a human started as and eventually became an entire multicellular organism. Uh, Walter Fleming actually published his findings on mitosis in 1878, and in later chapters, we'll be going into detail about exactly what's happening here. So, types of cells. Well, the cell theory tells us really what cells do, but there are two main types of cells that we'll see. The first type of cells are prokaryotes, and there are bacteria. You'll notice a couple things about this prokaryote. One, it has a cell wall, and it also has a cell membrane or a plasma membrane. So it's got two things separating it, and then we have our nuclear information here in the middle. This is DNA, and we have some ribosomes floating around in it. This one has a flagellum, which will help it move, but there's no real organelles inside this cell. Prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles. They tend to be much smaller than eukaryotes, and they certainly don't have a nucleus. If we're looking at a cell and it has a nucleus, like this animal cell over here, we know we're looking at a eukaryote. You are an animal, a mammal, and if you look at your cells, they have nuclei. They have a nucleus at the center that contains the genetic material for that organism. They also have other membrane-bound organelles, such as mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. They'll generate energy for it, and... This particular organelle is very indicative of eukaryotes. We don't find it in prokaryotes, and so on and so forth. There are multiple other examples of membrane-bound organelles here. That's the main difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes 
is whether or not they've got that membrane-bound organelle. Remember, you are a eukaryote. Humans have nuclei. And typically speaking, eukaryotes are much larger than prokaryotes.